We have the warden here from Essex County. Would you like to see a few things? I would. Okay. Tom Bain, if you don't know, is the warden of Essex County. Thank you very much. And also the mayor of the town of Lakeshore. And that's one of, I, I've got a number of points I want to make, but that's one of the points I want to make. Uh, you're shorting yourself on your catchment area. I noticed when you put it up on the board, I, I said to Tarab, what happened to Lakeshore? Where did we go? My wife and I, my wife on a pain reduction program, we are out here at Limington Hospital every other Saturday at 6.30 in the morning. Our doctor, Dr. Anderson, has 6,000 patients, and he works out of Limington Hospital. So I guess number one I'm saying to the Lynn board is, don't forget Lakeshore is a part of this also. The majority of our people south of 401 are out here, and a lot north, including myself. We're here in Limington. So I just want to make sure that uh, you increase that catchment area a little bit, that there's a lot more uh, out there. And also I have huge concerns, and, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to find some money to keep the OB going, to keep that program going. It's so important, and, and I refer uh, to what Mayor Patterson was speaking about with the economy and crumbling. I guess as mayors and Mayor Nelson and myself, we see that what can happen on a scale in your municipalities when one thing, whether it be the hospitals, whether it be your local factory, such as Heinz's or even on a smaller scale, the local gas station and then the restaurants, all of these items begin to crumble the communities. When these things start and you allow them to happen, it slowly crumbles our community and it begins to affect everything. When we are out there looking for growth in our communities and we're approaching families and we head off to areas such as Toronto or, or into the states, we're trying to attract them with schools, high school, elementary schools in the area, recreational centers, and a hospital. They want, those are the four big things that they want in there. And if any one of those begins to crumble, it feeds into the other areas. And people say, well, I'm not going. The young couples do their homework today. They do their research. They look at areas before they buy. I've met with so many people and they ask, what have you got to offer? And you say, come on, move to Lakeshore. What have you got to offer? And I want to be able to offer them full services so that we can attract these couples in here. Because if you let that spiral start downward, it just keeps spiraling. So I guess just in conclusion, I'm asking that you certainly give it your utmost thoughts and try to find that funding to keep that open, to keep us all in Essex County on board, growing a prosperous community. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions for the Mayor of Lakeshore? None, thanks. Next, um, we have Karen uh, Burton, who is Regional Vice President for the Ontario Nurses Association. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for the great turnout tonight. Um, my name is Karen Bertrand. I'm a registered nurse and Region 5 Vice President with the Ontario Nurses Association. I represent nurses who work in Leamington um, at the, at the uh, hospital. Small rural hospitals and the services provided in them are integral to the health of the community. I know that the priority of the government via this LEN is to freeze and reduce hospital funding while moving health care out of the hospitals into the community. Ona has been raising the alarm about the underfunding of hospital for about four years. 
While the intention may be to send more care into the community, depriving our hospitals of much needed funding to provide services is untenable. Leamington District Memorial Hospital is here for our community and we would be honored to be part of your childbirth experience. I'm quoting this line directly from the Maternal Newborn Services page on our hospital's website because our community hospital should continue to be honored to help mothers give birth here with care that's second to none, but they need the funding. It is unacceptable to expect families to drive 45 minutes minimum to receive care, especially from a government whose premier in her mandate letter to the health minister less than two months ago listed three goals. The first of which, and I quote, people receiving the right care at the right time and the right place. We've also heard from Mayor John Patterson tonight, but in a recent letter to the Premier, he said, the closure of the OB unit will result in the loss of up to 40 well-paying jobs, including registered nurses. Everyone knows that this is one of the last communities in the province that can stomach more layoffs now. What's even more striking is sending a message that young families should settle elsewhere. A side effect of not providing maternal newborn services in our community may actually do any chance of a sustained economical recovery here in the long term. As I said, I'm thrilled to see such community support at this meeting. Thanks so much for coming out and voicing your concern. The funding for the OB program is less than half of what it needs to be to sustain it. Over the past two years, Leamington Hospital has seen funding decreases of over $700,000. And as of December, that shortfall in funding rises by a one point, another $1.2 million, bringing the total of $2 million of funding that will have been removed from this rural hospital. The $1.2 million funding that's being removed was attached to the Assess and Restore program that we've heard a little bit about tonight. It's a service Leamington Hospital has been providing for this community. This program was innovative and it has been used as a model for care elsewhere in the province. These beds are now being transferred to Windsor. I fail to see how that serves this community and once again families are forced to drive to Windsor as another service is gone. Leamington Hospital serves this community, including a distinct underprivileged group whose income is well below the poverty line. The funding shortfall, the decrease in services, are essentially destabilizing this hospital, and the impact of the community will be significant. When you intentionally underfund programs, and in the example of the OB program, you will start to see doctors, nurses, <coughs> midwives, all of who are specialized in the delivery of this type of care leave the community. That forces patients who need that care to travel to Windsor or Chatham. These locations are between 50 to 60 kilometers away and a minimum of a 45 minute drive. This is a risk for both mother and baby. This is not just a concern regarding the actual delivery of the baby. When you are in a low income population, you do not always have transportation options or the finance to seek care that's not readily available. We will, see, we will see poor decisions being made and mothers not seeking prenatal care to the extent that they may have if the care was here. When best practice OB care is not available, the lasting cost to society can be enormous. If the baby is born with developmental problems or a mother has significant complications, what is the cost? Getting early and regular prenatal care is the best thing you can do to keep yourself and your developing infant healthy while you're pregnant. Potential complications are caught early and can prevent life-threatening issues for mother and baby during delivery. The best solutions to tough issues almost always comes from the front line. Ardlin was presented with a unique proposal in November of 2013. That proposal talked about an integrated program with two to three OBGYN doctors and two to three midwives. If approved, it would have built a sustainable rural program. This proposal was developed with a huge amount of staff input. 
This proposal is doable. Why not implement it? You would be out in front as an example that the rest of rural Ontario could mirror. What is so frustrating? <laughs> what is so frustrating to me is again and again we are seeing healthcare decisions driven by dollars and not our patients' needs or our community needs. The reality is that funding for rural care is going to be a choice that the Lins will have to make. I hope you're listening. The alternative puts lives at risk. The reality for the OB program is that the Lin provides less than half of what is needed to fund the program. The hospital board has its back against the wall. Without funding these rural hospitals, they will not be sustainable. And as we say, they will die on the vine. Mr. Switzer, you said it's our responsibility as the Lin to hear from the community. We especially want to know what worries local residents about the changes to Leamington District Memorial Hospital and what they have proposed. We will do our best to try and understand the concerns of residents and look for opportunities to find solutions. Mr. Switzer, we are worried. We are worried about the lasting effects on this population in this community. I'm urging you to preserve this vital service for the people of Leamington. You've been presented with a petition that began with 700 signature, uh, signatures and has grown to thousands. You've also been presented with solutions, solutions that would work to, sus to sustain an OB program. Now it is my hope that you're listening to this community. The next step is to act and move forward in providing the funding needed to be an example in Ontario of how to build an integrated model of delivery of care that sustains a vital service for our mothers and babies in this community. Show us that you can be and are the innovators that lead. The Canada Health Act guarantees accessibility of accessibility and comprehensiveness, supports this community's assertion that we deserve OB services in our hospital. The proposal to shutter the obstetrical unit is bad public policy, bad health care, and it should not be supported by the LINS. <laughs> to conclude, the nurses here and across Ontario urge you to reject the proposed cuts and greenlight the collaborative care model as a viable alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wonder if you could stay and see if we have any questions. For any board questions? Uh, Barb, or Barb? Well, I guess there's just one question, and it's still one that is out there, and, and there seems to be no answers to. In terms of, do you have any stats in terms of the 50% of women that do go to, uh, that make the 45 minute drive in terms of any risks that they have occurred on the, en route? Because that seems to be the contention, notwithstanding the fact that women want to have births in Leamington. I don't have any stats on the 50%. I've only got um, personal stories. Um, my, I've got four children. Um, my third child uh, was delivered within an hour from first sign of going into labor to delivery. If I had lived in Leamington, I wouldn't have made it. Um, that's a personal story. Um, how often does that happen? I can't answer that. There may be other people um, experts in the room that can do that for you. Thank you. The other question, I believe, is, is, is it not correct that prenatal and postnatal care will still be done at Leamington District Memorial Hospital? As, as long as Dr. Chan, uh, apparently she has uh, uh, um, obtained privileges at Windsor Regional and is committed to uh, having prenatal and postnatal care here, um, that's one person. Um, and as long as she remains, that doesn't guarantee anything in the future. That's not a sustainable, it's one person um, okay. for today. Thank you. I have one more question. Just one more question. Mark? Mark? Yeah. Joseph. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Obviously, you've studied this uh, whole issue uh, quite well. I was just wondering, uh, have you looked into the reasons why so many women choose to go to Wind? Uh, I have not done that. I don't know if uh, some of the nurses in the room could speak to that. Um, no, I have, I have not looked into that at all. I know for a short time there wasn't an anesthetist at the hospital, but that has been um, 
um, they have recruited someone now, so that's not an issue at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, we have a couple. Uh, Lindsay? Yes, and I'm not sure if this is a question for Terry, so I apologize if it belongs to Terry. Uh, Terry's she was, welcome to come and join me oh, if you sure. can answer it. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. <laughs> Terry, uh, just for the benefit of getting educated a little bit on the rotation required for 7x4 obstetrics in terms of doctors and nurses. Uh, thank you. So at the hospital, Dr. Zabka, Dr. Guman, uh, Dr. Chan, Dr. Campo uh, have done a good job with regards to coverage. So when we take a look at the services on the three pillars, quality, risk, and financial. We just got our born report card, and I actually brought it with me, so I can, I can pass that out to you. Our born report card is, is Rebecca here. Where's Rebecca? Okay, Rebecca, stand up, please. Rebecca runs the, uh, the newborn, uh, the uh, maternal child uh, department at the hospital, and she can speak to this better than I can. So our results, when you take a look at the born uh, scorecard, are, are, are very good. And well done. So thank you very much for what you've done. And to the staff, well done. So when you take a look at it from a quality perspective, do we have that now? Okay, is that an issue? We don't believe so. Is there a risk? The best predictor of the future is the past. Okay, Dr. Guman, Dr. Guman's here. Dr. Sapka, I don't think he's here, but Dr. Chan is. Where's Dr. Chan? Okay, she's about as tall as I am, so uh, <laughs> she has the same problem I do. Um, so she can speak better to that. She can also speak better to the 50% that don't give birth at Edmonton. So people have talked about how we marketed the service. So if you go to our website, you'll see the marketing we've done. Mm -hmm. In the past year, our numbers have gone up 33%. That, that didn't happen. It didn't happen just by luck. Right? We have marketed the services. We have marketed them to the communities. We've done baby showers and so forth. Okay? Rebecca, Dr. Chan, Andrea, I see you over there too. You were there, right? We've also marketed to the family physicians because they're the ones that do the referral pattern. So from a coverage perspective, is there an issue? I, I don't see it. I don't, you know, based off history from today backwards, I don't think that exists uh, for what we've seen. The actual facts would say, no, there's not. Thanks. Uh, I have one more question, uh, Karen. You mentioned 40 staff uh, losing 40 staff? Could that, that was a quote from Mayor Patterson. Could Terry, could you yeah, clarify so that 40, for yeah, 40 us? Please? Staff, 40 staff is that effective in December, the Assess and Restore program will close. Okay? The staff that are directly aligned with the Assess and Restore program, the RPNs and PSWs, total approximately 23. That has gone down a little bit to about 20. Some people have already left. We rescinded one or two. Those 20, 22, 23, Plus the 16 staff that are affected on the OB unit, 23, 16, 40. Could, could you address the assess and restore? Because I heard the comment from Karen uh, uh, about the, uh, the the concept of assess. Could you could you address the original intent of that uh, program? Sure. Like um, when I first joined the hospital, assess and restore was there, and it was there because the Lynn had faith in the hospital to put it there. There was a, there was a funding or a delay in the building of the Schlegel Village in Windsor, okay? It was set up as a pilot program, and this is an area of contention, okay? So I will be truthful with you. Um, our interpretation was this was a pilot program. And given the results of that pilot program, how well we did in that pilot program, as acknowledged by a third-party consultant, therefore trying to remove bias from it, the expectation is if you hit a home run, you get another chance to hit one. Um, so we we really struggled with that element of it. So I, and I guess the the question I had then, because you mentioned Slago Home, because th those dollars were specifically designed across the province or across the county, I should say, to uh, to have an interim bridge between the op the, the opening of the Slago Home. Is that that that's our understanding? Right. Okay. Exactly. So we don't we don't. And now control dollars past the hospital, right. nor do we have much value okay. in participating in, in trying to control your dollars. Right. Right? Okay. We have enough of a challenge trying to control okay. ours. And could you also speak to the chart that you uh, raised before in terms of the increase in beds? So I understand you're, you're counting the, the number of staff, that, but what about the, the increase in beds? How is that going to impact on the uh, staff? There, there really is not an increase in beds. Uh, 
So right now we have five complex continuing beds, 10 in sesame store beds. That will go down to 10 complex continuing care beds. On OB, there's eight beds. It doesn't matter if there's three beds, eight beds, or 100 beds. It's completely irrelevant, okay? We staff two qualified OB nurses 24 hours a day. Those five beds on the OB unit, total of eight, three are actually used for labor and delivery. The other five are just unstaffed beds that are there that will be repurposed relative to what we believe might happen in the future. But we're not staffing those effective April 1st, 2015. Right? We're going to have to see. There's a projection that was given by Hay that the utilization of the hospital will go up due to all getting older. Right? I'm getting older. I see it every day. So based on those projections, we think utilization will drive more beds. But it's not going to happen on April 1st, 2015. So there's a bridge. If I can understand, then there's a bridge problem, right, in terms of timing? Yeah, there is a bridge problem. Okay. We want to keep the... So when we submitted our original budget to the LIN, we kept... We know perfectly well that the funding was ending in December. They made it perfectly clear. Right? We kept that... Uh, when we submitted our budget, we submitted a deficit of approximately 300000 which represents running the assessment store. Uh, for three additional months, even though the funding ended. Right? So in order to transition uh, to the CCC, uh, we've actually you know, put a letter, Jim Gaffin, who's not here with us today, put a letter in for them with regards to the funding impact. Okay, that's uh, Barb, I think you had a question. Yeah, I have one more question, but first I want to thank all the presenters because they certainly have given their heart and soul into informing us, and that helps us when we make our final decision. In terms of, uh, Karen, maybe you can answer this. Is there a requirement when you have a midwifery program in terms of how far you have to be from an OB unit? I think that there is a midwife in the room that would be best uh, able to answer that question around. Uh, We're going to have a presentation by the. Uh, oh, okay. By them, uh, uh, if next, you could hold so that question for her, that would well, be appropriate. That, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Lindsay? And Terry, sorry, uh, I was actually looking for a number in terms of a comprehensive OB 7 by 24. What staffing would you re You mentioned two. You had two registered OB. Yeah, so you, are you talking dollars? Well, no, I'm actually ta talking staff numbers. The staffing is required. But the staffing requirement because the regulation is you have to have two trained OB yes. nurses in the, in the building at all times. So that would be three shifts a day? Three shifts a day. Okay. And doctors? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. They're on 12 hour shifts. 12 hour shifts. Two. Okay, that's fine. So if you're on eight hour shifts, it's three. And, and so let me put same with doctors, 12. you'd have to have one on staff at least? Or? No, we have two OBGYNs yep. conceptually. Uh, and we have a family, a family doctor, the prostate doctor, the staff has a family doctor who deliver babies. And we also have uh, a few midwives. And they're no longer available once this is put forward, the changes. Or they would be well, they, they wouldn't be. Um, for not pre or post natal? So, pre and post natal, it's, it's not really all that clear cut. Okay. Um, so, we have to actually figure out what we can do safely at the hospital and what is safe for the patient and also what is safe for the staff. Okay, so it's not like uh, it, it's, it, you know, you can't just say you can do this easily. So, we have to pick and choose what we'll be able to do for the community. Right? So, with regards to one doctor, uh, Dr. Chan, uh, we'll be maintaining your services at the hospital for now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are they, uh, did you want to have a comment? Yeah, I've got uh, just a question for Karen. Might be clarification. Uh, like you've heard already, our staff are very proud of the work that's happening at the hospital with the Assess and Restore program that was put in with the bridge funding. And uh, the funding does cease because it was provincial funding for bridge purposes. Uh, and I'm just wondering the source of your information where, uh, unless I misheard you, you said the beds are going to Windsor. Yes, they are going to a home in Windsor, a nursing home, Schlegel? Schlegel. Oh, okay, so, th that's, so there's no beds going to Windsor. The, the bridge funding was until the, the, until, until the long-term care home opened up, then the funding would go there. So what the Lynn did three years ago now, we negotiated with the government says, you're late on that home, we need funds for our community, and we were successful in um, having this bridge funding of uh, close to $13 million for our region, which was to bridge us to get to the new home. So I just wanted clarity that beds actually didn't get up and move. No. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Karen.
Okay, um, now I, I did want to address yeah. uh, one comment. Um, 